Good morning. Opening song this morning, 435. 435. We'll do this one twice through. <laughs> Coming to his presence with thanksgiving in your heart and give him praise. And give him praise. Coming to his presence with thanksgiving in your heart. Your voice is raised. Your voice is raised. tonight at five o'clock for our evening worship services. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, go ahead and start filling out the attendance cards in the back of the pews and send those on down. Uh, stack them up on the end of the aisle on those ledges and we'll, we'll pick those up here in just a minute. Um, I want to remind everybody that there's a VBS meeting in room B12 after services this morning. So if you uh, um, want to help out with VBS or if you just want to go to know what's going on and you don't want to help out then that's fine uh, it shouldn't take too terribly long and um, and then we'll be on to to our favorite restaurants to eat lunch um, I have a few things I want to mention we have we'll start with with good uh, Keith Frohawk wanted me to mention, um, or tell you thanks for all the prayers for his Aunt Jane. Says that he, uh, he really believes that they are working because uh, she's doing better. So please keep your prayers up. But he wants to uh, express his thanks for that. Um, Brenda Nemo has pneumonia and is getting put on a ventilator. So please keep her in your prayers. And also... Uh, Donnie Coffert's headed to Modelta this morning. Um, he had some medical emergency, so keep uh, their family in your prayers as well. I want to mention um, some area events coming up. April 20th through the 24th, there's a gospel meeting at Cape County Church of Christ. Uh, it says in Jackson, Missouri. Um, Stephen Walker, Ph.D. <laughs> Ph.D is uh, the speaker, so if you want to go support them, that's April 20th through the 24th. A Seeking the Truth seminar will be at Highland Drive Church of Christ in Poplar Bluff. That's April 27th and 28th, April 27th and 28th. Um, and for Fair Havens Children's Home, one of the ones that we help out April 27th, says if you're looking at the bulletin, says you're invited to uh, their campus to celebrate the past 60 years and looking forward to the next 60. Um, they'll have food, fun for the kids, and uh, open houses for the offices for, for viewing and that kind of thing. So if you want to go there, that's April 27th as well. Um, anything else that needs to be mentioned? I encourage you to look at the announcement sheet and the bulletin for other information. There's Lots of other things going on, um, and stay tuned to those. Know what's going on, All right? Song before opening prayers, three ninety six. 
396. There's not a friend like the lowly. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this day that we can come here and worship you without harm or fear. Thank you for each one here, Lord, and I pray that you will be with each one of us. Help us love to grow for one another, help one another, and be an example of those around about us that we can bring lost souls to you. And be with our country, Lord. I pray that you'll watch over our leaders and help them to look to you for guidance and strength in a world that's so much evil. And I pray that you'll just be with us, our, our country, Lord, and us to come back to you. Be with Keith as he brings a message to us today. Help us to be uplifted, Lord, and be with us always. Bless us and keep us safe, Lord, and forgive us for our sins. In Christ's name, amen. The song we're going to sing to help prepare us for communion is will be on the screen only in Christ alone. On the screen only. In Christ alone, my hope is found.
As I say the prayers this morning in preparation for this, I'd ask that you would, as we, say, as we pray it in your mind, see the situations that our Lord was in. See the situations that he went through for us. Would you bow with me, please? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you first thanking you for this, this blessing you've given us, your Son. We'd ask that you would help us to understand the power of you and of him and what he went through for us. I ask that you would bless us this bread, which represents his body that was beaten and scourged. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. bow again please likewise father we ask your blessings on on us as we perform this ritual we ask your blessings on this this fruit of the vine which represents the blood that was shed by our lord jesus christ it was shed by the nails by the crown on his head and the spear in his side. We ask, Father, you would bless it, help us to partake of it in a way that would be pleasing unto you. Once again, it's in your son's name. Amen. As these men pass the trays, think about all the good this church has done. We've had speakers come in, minister, or missionaries come in and tell of the things that we're a part of, and that's what God tells us to do.
We have a nice building that we can worship in. We have good things in our life that God has given us so that we may give back a portion as we see fit. you bow, please? Our gracious, most heavenly Father, all these things that I just mentioned are, are wonderful things. They're things that we're commanded to do. We hope we've done them in a way that be pleasing unto you. We'd ask your blessings on this money so they can be used wisely for these items and for the furtherance of your word. It's in your son Jesus' name. Amen. If you're using a songbook and want to mark the song of invitation, that will be 662. The song before the scripture reading and the lesson will be 450. Ask if you would, please stand for this song and the scripture reading following this song. Give me the Bible, star of gladness, please. Matthew chapter 9, Matthew chapter 9 and verses 27 through 31. When Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him, crying out and saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when he had come into the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. 
Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, let it be to you. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus sternly warned them, saying, See that no one knows it. And when they had departed, they spread the news about him in all that country. Please be seated. It is great to see everyone uh, here this morning. Uh, I, I want to tell you that um, uh, it's, it's been one of those mornings where things just have not wanted to work very well. Um, I, and I, I'll tell you some of that. Uh, first of all, we pulled up into the parking lot and I started getting uh, out to come inside and, and I kind of went, oh man, I don't have any glasses. So what I've got here this morning are my backup pair that, that I keep uh, in the, the back of the desk drawer in my office. And, and so uh, if I misread something, I'm going to blame it on the backup pair of glasses. Um, but then I started to, uh, to give my, uh, my presentation to the sound booth and it's gone. I mean, I still haven't found I don't know where it is. Um, I know it's on my computer at the house, but it's on my computer at the house. And so, no presentation. Um, now, here's the thing about that. The presentation was my notes. <laughs> and so... I sat down and I had to uh, rewrite it from memory and uh, just, just kind of scribbled it down and that's, that's what we got this morning. So you might think, well, that's, that's good. He doesn't have notes. A notes tell a preacher where not to go. They don't tell a preacher where to go. They tell a preacher where not to go. So I'm, I'm just saying that, you know, we may be here a while. Um, but... I want to welcome you to our services today. If you're visiting with us, we especially want to welcome you and hope that you will come back and be with us at every opportunity. Uh, two things in addition to the announcements that I want to mention real quick. Number one, uh, my dad, David Albright, he's going to be having surgery this coming Thursday, and so I would appreciate your prayers uh, on his behalf. And number two, we are going to have a blood drive, and that is tomorrow. And that will be in the gym from 12.30 to 5.30. And if you are signed up, don't forget, please show up and donate. If you are not signed up, uh, I hope that, uh, that you can either get signed up today or, or that you can drop by tomorrow and, and maybe they can get you worked in. Uh, but those, those blood drives are, are so, so very important. And... Um, you know, we, we want to do our part to help uh, in that regard. So I had some really cool pictures to show you. I did. Um, but you're going to have to use your imagination because the, the pictures aren't there. But did you know that there is a bulldozer, a Komatsu D755? No, that is billed as the largest production bulldozer ever made. They stopped making them back in about 2012, but, but this monster of a bulldozer had a blade on it that was 24 feet wide, could push up to 90 cubic yards of dirt in one swath. The thing was 38 feet long, 16 feet high, powered by and a, a 1,150 horsepower engine. And if you wanted to buy one, I, I looked this up too, I don't know why, but I saw one for sale for $875,000. Um, it weighs 145 tons. 145 tons. But that's not the most powerful thing that has ever been created. There is an excavator, a, a Lieber R9800. I think they're made in France. 
The thing is a beast. The, the, the bucket on this excavator can scoop 50 cubic yards of dirt at one time. Now, to put that in perspective, if you own a, a, a half-ton pickup truck, a yard, you know, give or take a little bit, one yard is about all that you're going to want to put in there um, of, of dirt or sand or, or something like that. You, you might get a little more. Uh, but one scoop with this thing, 50 yards of dirt, it weighs 810 tons. Powered by an engine 4,000 horsepower. And it's not the most powerful thing that was ever made. You see, when we look at the Word of God, and, and we see the different descriptions of Jesus, uh, and, and there are a lot of different names that, that Jesus is known by, but when we associate those things with power, we might not think about Jesus as being the sacrificial lamb. That's a pretty powerful de description of Jesus. He is described as being the King of kings and Lord of lords. But that's not the most powerful description of Jesus. He is described as the captain of our salvation. Hebrews chapter, 10, uh, chapter 2 and verse 10. Not the most powerful description, nor is him being described in the book of Isaiah as being the, uh, excuse me, the book of Revelation as the lion of the tribe of Judah. John gave Jesus the most powerful description possible in John chapter 1 and verse 1. And he said there in John 1 and verse 1, in the beginning was. Somebody finish it. The Word. And we read that and we might think, in the beginning was the Word. We're going to call Jesus the Word? My friends, that is the most powerful thing that has ever been made. Because without words, we can do nothing. Without words, we cannot, <coughs> excuse me, we cannot have ideas. Without words, we cannot express fully the love that we might have. Without words, we cannot offer an apology. Without words, we cannot know one another. And God, the Bible tells us, created in Genesis chapter 1 with words. That, that was the power that God used to create. It was words. And so as we read in John chapter 1 and verse 1, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You are talking about the most powerful thing that is ever imaginable here on the face of this planet. And we use those words all the time. And, and we, uh, some, some, of course, use words more than others, but, but those words are so important and so powerful and so careless. Now, I want you to think, if you will, going back to our, <coughs> excuse me, our scripture reading in Matthew chapter 9 and verses 27 and following. We read through this story, and Jesus departed from there. Two blind men followed Him, crying out, saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And He came into the house. The blind men came to Him, and Jesus said this to them. He said, Do you believe that I am able to do this? Now the only request that we know of that they had asked was for mercy. Son of David, have mercy on us. And Jesus turns around and He says, do, do you think I can do this? Now I'm going to tell you something. If I were a blind man and somebody was claiming to have the ability to, to give me sight, and, and if I really wanted sight, and they asked me that question, do you, do you think that I can do this? Do you believe that I am able to do this? I'll be honest with you, I'm probably going to tell them whatever they want to hear. 
I'm just being honest. I'm going to tell them whatever they want to hear in hope, in the desire that I'm going to be able to receive what it is that is being offered. And, and so many different instances within the Scriptures, people are coming to Jesus and, and they are displaying this tremendous amount of faith. And here on this occasion, all Jesus said was, do you believe that I am able to do this? And, and of course, of course they said, yes, Lord. You know, I've always wondered in the next verse there, it says that Jesus touched their eyes. I wonder what they felt when Jesus touched their eyes. Have any of you ever like gotten a little electrical shock or, or a little twinge of, of, of... You could feel the power that was there. I wonder if their eyes tingled when the Son of God touched them. I, I don't know. It doesn't matter. But just, just kind, of, kind of curiosity on, on my part. Do you believe that I am able to do this? And we ask ourselves that question regarding the Son of God. And, and we might ask, first of all, do I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? I don't have any reason to say no. And let's be honest, it's, it's very easy to say yes. Yes, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. What have I got to lose? But do I believe? Do I really believe that He is the Son of God? And we can ask ourselves, because let's be honest, we, we cry out to the Lord figuratively, more than likely. Son of David, have mercy on me. But do I believe that He is able to forgive my sins? You know, that's really why Jesus came to this earth. And in Luke 19 and verse 10, Jesus is talking to um, Zacchaeus. Uh, he was in the house of Zacchaeus there in Luke 19.10. And the Bible says that the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus came to bring the forgiveness of sins to us. Do you believe that He is able to forgive your sins? It's very easy for us to say yes, but what about when it comes time to, uh, uh, to actually receive that forgiveness of sins? On the event of uh, another miraculous occasion, if you turn your Bibles over to Mark chapter 2, Mark chapter 2, this is the account where the four friends bring the guy who is a paralytic, and they, uh, they open up the roof, and they, they let the guy down through the roof, and, um, and Jesus saw their faith, and the Bible says, verse 5, that He said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you, some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoned in their heart, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately when Jesus perceived in His Spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, He said to them, why do you reason about these things in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sons are forgiven you, or to say, arise, take up your bed and walk? Verse 10, Jesus said this, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. That you may know that he has the power to forgive sins. And on that occasion, we know he, he granted that healing that the man desired, that, that the man's friends desired. He was able to get up, and, and I don't know why, I, I just, you know, what, what images we have of, of what a scene looked like. I always kind of picture it as uh, uh, he's rolling up his sleeping bag. Uh, at the end of a camping trip. And here, here's this guy who could not walk and he's down on his hands and knees and he's, he's trying to get his sleeping bag rolled up and, and he gets done and he, he puts it on his shoulder and he walks out of that house. That's just the picture I've got. You don't have to have that picture. But he showed them that Jesus had that power. 
And when we, we think of that power and we, we talk about that power to have our sins forgiven, uh, the, the Apostle Paul certainly um, was one, and I want you to notice this uh, about the, uh, the Apostle Paul. Um, if, if you turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul writes to Timothy and he says in verse 12, well, let's yeah, start in verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because He counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. And then he says this about himself in verse 13. Although formerly I was a blasphemer, I was a persecutor and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Now, here, here's the picture that we have of the Apostle Paul here in, in 1 Timothy 1 and verse 13. We look back, we, we know quite a bit about him before Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus. We know some of the things that he did. We know that he was set on destroying the church that Jesus died for. We know that he was bound and determined that he was going to silence those who said they believed in the name of Jesus. He bound some, he cast some into prison, and it seems as though that even though it may not have been his hand, that he was responsible for some of those who confessed their belief in Christ being put to death. And here he is some years later, and he's writing to Timothy, and he's saying, that's who I was. I, I, I blasphemed. I persecuted every chance that I had. I did so much wrong. But that's not me anymore. And he acknowledges that he was forgiven. So, so here's the thing about it. If we ask that question, do you believe that He is able to forgive you of your sins. Are you able to forgive yourself? Because if you are not able to forgive yourself and, and to move on and to live your life as if you were forgiven, did you really believe? Or were you just saying, what you thought Jesus wanted to hear. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7, Paul says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. We know that Jesus came to this earth to seek and to save that which was lost. We know that He had the power to forgive sins. He, he demonstrated that power by allowing people to rise and walk, by giving sight to the blind. All of those things that were uh, miraculous healings of the physical body, Jesus said He did them to demonstrate that if, if He could do that, He could forgive our sins. Do you believe? How about this? Son of David, have mercy on me. Do you believe that He is able to raise you up on the last day? Now, when we look at that question, again, that is one of those things that, that may be very easy to say. When, when we talk about the resurrection of the dead, we want to believe in the resurrection of the dead. We want to have the hope that we're going to see our loved ones again. We want to believe that we are going to spend eternity in the presence of God. And so we ask that question and it's very easy to say, yes, yes, I believe that He is able to, uh, to raise me from the dead. Jesus pretty much asked that question of somebody. If, if you look over in John chapter 11, uh, of course, this is the, uh, the chapter where the friend of Jesus, Lazarus, died. 
And by the time Jesus got there, Lazarus was buried. He was in the tomb. Um, and, and the mourners are there and there, there's weeping. And, and they had accepted the fact that Lazarus was in that tomb and he wasn't coming out of that tomb anytime soon. But before Jesus went to the tomb and, and he said those famous words, Lazarus, come forth. He had a conversation with Martha. And in that conversation with Martha here in um, John chapter 11, uh, Jesus said to him, uh, said to her, your brother will rise again. Verse 23. Verse 24, Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And you know, as I read these words that Martha said to Jesus, I believe that she believed. Martha said to Jesus, Yes, Lord, I believe that You are the Christ, the Son of God who, who is to come into the world. I, I believe Martha. I believe that Martha believed. And I believe that I must believe. More so than, than just hoping because the, the alternative uh, doesn't... doesn't uh, deserve much consideration in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 the the latter half of this chapter and continuing into chapter 5 Paul talks about uh, a lot about overcoming uh, he talks about life after this life and and in verse 14 he says this 2 Corinthians 4 14 knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with Him. Now Paul is showing the confidence that yes, there is going to be a resurrection of the dead and that resurrection of the dead is going to be through Jesus and it's going to be with Jesus and those who have died are going to rise and they are going to be with Jesus. Jesus. In Titus chapter 2 and, and verse 13, this, this gives us a, a, a very lofty and, and high goal for the way that we live our lives. But, but Paul says this in Titus 2.13, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Paul said, that's it. That's what we're looking for. Did, did everybody enjoy the eclipse last Monday? Did anybody miss it? I know that there's, there's got to be a few who missed it. I know of some who were working and, and were not able to see it. But, uh, you know, it, it, was, it was just kind of enjoyable. And here's the thing about it is, you know, we, we knew that eclipse was coming. We were ready at 2 o'clock in the afternoon for it, for it to come or, or thereabouts. Um, we, we had made all of the preparations. Um, my, my friend Doc Wilbanks, he was uh, in town. And, and I got to tell you, he's a nerd uh, when it comes to stuff like that. You know, he, he had, uh, you know, some, some really nerdy glasses that he put on. And, and you probably had some. I hope you had some uh, if you were going to look up at it. But um, then my sister just kind of showed up, wasn't really expecting her. And, and she and my nephew showed up from Nashville and they came over. And, and before the eclipse started, we're, we're out there and we're taking pictures of everybody wearing their nerdy glasses and and staring up at the sun. We, we were just, we were having a good time. We were ready for that eclipse. 
Paul here in Titus chapter 2 and verse 13, when he talks about looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing, he says that's, that's what we've got to be ready for. We've got to have made all of the preparations. We, we've got to be anxious and, and excited and waiting to see our Savior. Do you believe that He is able to raise you up? Son of David, have mercy on me. Do you believe that He is able to change your life? To make you into who you ought to be. Now, if you're still there in Titus chapter 2, you know, we, uh, uh, we read verse 13 there, but let's, let's back up a couple of verses in Titus 2. We go to verse 11, and, and Paul said, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Folks, that's a change. If we are looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our Savior, we are going to have a change in our lives. We're not going to be the people that we were before. We're not going to live the way that the world around us is living. We're not going to talk the way that the world is talking. We're not going to go the, to the places and do the things. There is going to be a change. We are going to love godliness. We are going to love righteousness. We are going to love one another. And we're going to want to live our lives accordingly. Why? Because we want to be ready when He comes again. He can change our lives. And we go to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 6. And uh, Romans chapter 6 is um, um, it's actually a really cool chapter that, that Paul wrote here. But uh, he, he starts out by saying, um, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not, Paul says. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? So right there at the very start of the chapter, Paul starts talking about we, we're, we've changed or we've, we've got to change. And then he starts talking about being baptized into Christ. Verse 3, he says, Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into His death? Therefore, we are buried with Him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Okay, so a very simple picture that Paul gives us. Jesus went to the cross. He died on the cross. He was buried in a tomb. He came out of that tomb. We go to the watery grave of baptism, and we go down into that water and we bury the old man in water. But just like Jesus didn't stay in the tomb, we don't stay in that tomb. We come out of that water. We don't stay in that. We, we, we can't breathe in that water. We are not going to live as long as we stay in the water. We have to come out of that water. And everybody's going, well, well, duh. I know that. But when we come out of that water, we're not living like we were before we went into the water. You see, we have to believe that Jesus is able to change us. To make us who we ought to be. And if we go into that watery grave of baptism, we can't expect to be the person that we were before. 
And he goes on here in Romans 6, and, and uh, he, he says this in verse 6, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. We go on down to verses 12 and 13. He says, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies, that you should obey it in its lust." And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. <laughs> Paul says, if you're going to put that old man to death and you, you're going to rise like a new man, then you better live like the new man. Not like the old man. Uh, Jesus changed my life. He has the power. He is able to change our lives. Are we willing to let Him change our lives? Are we willing to, to live like we are alive in Him. Putting that old man away and living in preparation for when He is going to appear again. Maybe you are here today and you know that your life isn't ready. Perhaps you've not been obedient to this, uh, this gospel that we read of here in Romans chapter 6. And uh, maybe you have never gone into that death of being buried with Christ so that you can rise with Christ to walk in newness of life. Or maybe it is that you have done that before, but you're not living as if you really believe. You're not living as if you believe that He can forgive you of your sins. You're not living as if you really believe that He can raise you up. You're not living like you want Him to change your life. My friends, if you've got a spiritual need this morning, we give you this invitation and we beg you to come while we stand and sing.
If there's uh, no other announcements to be made at this time, we'll sing our closing song, which will be 412. 412. Uh, following this song, we'll have our closing prayer and be dismissed. As I travel through this pilgrim land, there is a friend who walks with me. Leads me safely through the stinking sand to the rocks of Calvary. This would be my prayer to glory each day to know me through the best I can. Dearly Father, we thank you for this morning of worship. We have been able to have and hope that we've pleased you with our praises, Father. Be with us and protect our Christian brothers and sisters in the Middle East as things continue to escalate in that region. Father, be with the ones of our church family that are sick. Father, we ask a special blessing for Brenda Nemo and Donnie Coffer this morning. Be with the doctors that are caring for them Please bring your power of healing on them. Father, let us all challenge ourselves to be back again tonight for another hour of worship and fellowship. Forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name we pray.